future highways. I'm not going to give you any answers uh, today. I'm just going to pose a number of sort of questions and challenges and give you some thoughts on the sort of things that are exercising my brain on a daily basis at work. Uh, that's the sort of picture we have nowadays. Some of you may recognize, uh, and I dread to almost say it, the infamous Army and Navy flyover in Chelmsford. Uh, but this is what we're facing every day at the moment. We're facing congestion. What causes congestion? What actually is it that makes uh, traffic queues? Very simple answer. Too many of us wanting to be in the same place at the same time. So if we weren't all going in the same place at the same time, we wouldn't have queues like that. I must admit, I'm one of the people who queues every morning for the flyover because I want to get to work by half past eight, which is what everybody else is wanting to do. So too many of us getting in the, in the same place at the same time, causing those delays. Those delays really are what we have to try and deal with and try and tackle. It is a real challenge for us. Congestion not only gives frustration, which can then lead to rash behavior and rushing and then can lead to accidents and collisions, but it also increases the damage on our road network every day. So if we can try and tackle congestion, we can tackle a whole range of, of issues and items. The other thing that we're becoming more and more conscious of nowadays is the impact of congestion on our health and our health through air quality issues. And we start to see those air quality issues bubbling up around the county. We're more aware of those health issues nowadays. And we have government targets to meet on air quality, which are changing the way we, we think about air quality and its impact. But we also have people uh, not walking anywhere. People not, not getting out of their cars, not walking to schools, not walking to work, not walking to the shops. We actually need to change the mode of transport that we use to address health issues, both through air quality and also through um, improved uh, activity. Uh, and some of the things previous speakers have said, you know, feeling better about yourself, getting out there and enjoying the countryside, enjoying your walk to work, gives you time to actually think. For a year or so, I, I lived in North Springfield, actually, and I walked into County Hall every day. Um, with my husband and a two and a half mile there and two and a half mile back and it was great because by the time we got home we'd done all the moaning about work work was behind us and we could then focus on the evening in front of us so we got the health benefits we also got the mental benefits of putting all the aggravation behind us we hear a lot about the future and electric cars and electric cars will come and solve everything for us uh, electric cars will solve some things. They'll help us with air pollution because they won't have such pollution. Although we do need to think about the pollution and the issues involved in creating and building electric cars and building the batteries that, that power them. But electric cars are something that can help us to solve some of the problems. So we have electric cars and we have electric buses. They will deal with, with uh, pollution. They won't deal with congestion. Because if I leave my nice diesel Mercedes and get a nice Tesla or a nice Nissan Leaf, I'm still going to occupy the same road space. It's not going to do anything for congestion, but it will help with air, air pollution. It may actually make some things worse. So what makes you choose to buy an electric car if you don't have any off-street parking, if you don't have anywhere to park it and charge it up? If you do that, where are you going to park it to charge it? How are you going to get your lead from your house across the footway, across the pavement, into your car that's parked in the street? What if you can't find a parking space in the street? Do we have to provide electric charging points? If we do, who's going to provide them? How are they going to be paid for? How do we make sure they're safe? How do we make sure they're maintained? So electric cars themselves solve some problems, but also give us lots more questions and lots more things that we need to think about. And one challenge for me particularly, as I say, is in Chelmsford, where we have terraced houses that don't have any off-street parking. It's how we deal with the request for, I'd really like an electric charging point outside my house because I've bought an electric car and pick up on the previous speakers. I now have a plug and I have nowhere to plug it into. Uh, you know, People ask us as the local authority, what can I do? We don't necessarily have the answers. Maybe more importantly to reduce congestion is modal shift. And modal shift sounds very fancy, but modal shift is just actually illustrated by this slide. If you look at the first slide, all those people fit on a bus. See how much space the bus takes up in the highway? Lots of space around it. If you take the people off the bus and put them on bikes, the next um, in the middle shows you how much space they would occupy on the road. If you take all those people out of the bus and put them in cars, that's what we get. And that's where we are at the moment. Not enough people getting out of the cars, single occupancy cars, not enough people getting out, getting on their bike or on the bus. So how do we actually encourage people to do that? The bus, the bicycle, walking isn't suitable for every journey. What we're saying to people now is two kilometers, two kilometers is about a 15 minute walk. 
Why can't you walk two kilometres? Why can't you walk from the edge of Chelmsford into the middle of Chelmsford? If you live a bit further out, why not use a bus or a bike if you're making a journey of five kilometres? It really should only be the very long journeys that we're even thinking about using our car. And then if we're going to use our car, why not car share? Why not cut that amount of cars in half by just giving one other person a lift in your car and car sharing? So those are the sort of challenges we have moving forward. When I was sort of preparing for this talk, I had a chat with Mark and he said, you know, well, why don't we just build more roads? And one of the things that popped into my head was a line from a film, a 1989 film called Field of Dreams. And if anybody's seen that, you know it's about a guy who builds a baseball field. Uh, and there's nobody who's going to use a baseball field. But the line in the film is, if you build it, they will come. If we build a new road, the cars will come and fill it up. So building our way out of congestion isn't the solution. If I make a road, if I clear a road, it will just get filled up with traffic. People ask me, why can't you make the Army and Navy flyover free-flowing? Why can't you get rid of all those queues? If we got rid of all those queues, if I did have a magic wand, which I don't have, if I did get rid of all the queues at the Army and Navy, what would happen is that all of us in this room would say, oh, no more queues there. I'll go that way today. And we'd just go back and fill up the space we have. It's what we do. We look for the quickest way to work. We look for the quickest journey. So... We can't build our way out of congestion with new roads. What we can do is look at new developments. And this actually is a, a sort of an early um, image of, of Bewley. But we can look at these ideas of the new garden villages and garden settlements where we say everybody who lives there will maybe work there. The school will be there. The shops will be there. We'll actually minimise the need for travel. We might even not quite give enough parking space. We might even reduce the number of parking spaces per house. What happens? People move in. They've got two parking spaces for their car, and they have three cars. Not enough room for them to park. They then try and find somewhere to park within the development. We move into the development, and then we say, actually, I don't want to work nearby. My job's a bit further away. Or we say, I know there's a really nice school, but my children want to go to this school over here, or I want to go somewhere else. So actually, our garden developments are quite a challenge for us to think about our own future and about how we're going to work to manage those problems in the future. One of the themes, I think, for me is that we all have to work together to resolve these issues. We can't just expect other people to solve them. We have to think about, uh, as we've heard today, the consequences of our own choices, the consequences of the decisions we make about where we live, where we work, how we travel, impact on other people. The big thing for the future, connected autonomous vehicles, CAVs, or um, autonomous vehicles, vehicles that you don't have to drive. Great. That's going to be the solution. Vehicles that we don't have to actually drive, we can just sit in them. They'll all be pods. They'll all travel around by themselves. We won't own one. We'll all just jump in one as it comes past and then jump out when we get to our destination. Really? I have to admit, I am a self confessed Well, I'm not really. It's my husband. It's a self-confessed petrol head. I am wedded to my car. Probably not the best advert for highways, actually. I'm wedded to my car. I want to know what's going to stop me driving my car and make me get in a pod, or not have my own pod that I want to own, I want to drive, and actually it's going to have go faster stripes down the side, and it's going to have a big spoiler on the back, because that's what I like. Um, so what is it that, where's this nirvana going to come from, that suddenly we're going to stop owning our own car, and we're going to have these pods and drive around in them? Some really good consequences of having the pods is all those people who can't drive at the moment, all those older people who are stuck in their houses, maybe in the countryside, in the rural environment, who can't travel because they're too old to drive, or people who have disabilities that mean they can't drive, they'll be able to use all the pods, and they'll be able to get out. So actually, it will help with things like social inclusion and social isolation. But does that just mean there's going to be more pods on the road than there are cars now? So at the moment, when I get to... 75, 80, 85, I'll give up my driving license. In the future, when I'm 75, 80, 85, I won't. I'll get in a pod. So again, some different challenges for us there about how we're actually going to use these pods and how we'll travel around, if in fact they are going to be pods. The vehicles that, that will travel around in the future will all be connected. They'll talk to each other. They'll know where each other is. And they'll talk to the road environment and the road network. Again, that gives us some advantages because if the vehicles talk to each other, they'll be able to travel more closely together. And I remember years ago, I was at university doing a master's degree in road safety engineering. And our lecturer said, in the future, the vehicles will be able to talk together. So actually, they'll be able to drive really, really closely together. 
And that means then we can make platooning and we can make good use of the road space. And I had to put my hand up and say, excuse me, don't we call that a train? But that's the sort of thought process that we can get the vehicles to travel more closely together. It'll make better use of the road space, but it won't remove vehicles from the road space. It would just mean that we can use it better. One of the other um, thoughts that I have on this is, however, if all those vehicles are connecting to each other and are connecting to the road infrastructure and talking to each other, will they all drive in the same line? So at the moment, when you drive on the road, you have different wheelbase width of your car, you drive on a slightly different part of the road, so the road gets even wear. We do get potholes, I know, but we get generally even wear across the road. If we're all in a little platoon, connected and following each other, are we just going to run two wheel tracks down the middle of the road and they'll get worn out and they'll be full of potholes and then it'll be a bumpy train track and we'll all, you know, what's it actually going to mean for us in the future? How is, is that congestion, how is that traffic actually going to look? So what does the future look like? I've whisked through it very quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, but what does the future look like for us? Is it going to be all nice and new and shiny and we're going to be riding around in our pods and we're going to be all connected, we've heard about connected today, all connected, all talking, uh, re relaxing and resting in our cars. Will it be this? Will it be drones delivering things? Will it be pods that you can call up, jump in, jump out of whenever you want to? Or is it going to be like that? I'm going to be the smug person riding past on a bicycle in 20 years' time while you will sit there in a queue of your own pods. Thank you. <laughs>